and continue. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our data mining class, uh, class number three for us. I hope you all had a good long weekend, as good of a long weekend as you can without having uh, data mining stuff to do on Monday. We didn't really have a whole lot of homework or things for you to do over the weekend. Um, but we will make up for that this weekend with uh, more things for you to do. Again, our class GitHub repository over here is what we're currently looking at. And there are, for those of you who want physical copies of handouts, there are three physical copies of handouts up here up front. I've also just posted a new issue. Uh, and again, if you are not, if you have not pressed this watch button on the GitHub repository, then you will not be notified when I post issues about things. In general, I will be posting issues and maybe not making corresponding announcements in class, but this time I'll make an announcement in class. And this uh, saving paper issue right here, if you would like for whatever reason to take notes electronically or you don't want a printout of whatever notes that we will be working on, then you can just reply to this uh, message right here and I will no longer print you out your own notes and we will say paper that way. But if you do nothing, if you take no action, then I will continue to print out uh, copies of our notes packets for you all. Uh, and again, three handouts for today up here up front if you uh, would like those physical copies. If you would like an electronic copy, the, way, the place to find them is under this Topic 1 uh, folder. I've just posted this new Topic 1 folder. And if you click that link, you'll come over to this page here. There's a lot of uh, stuff in this folder. But the three files that are important are this Topic 0 practice quiz right here this notes1.pdf right here, and this deeper inside page rank PDF right here. Those are the three files that I've printed out for uh, and have up front here. There's also some quick announcements here, administrative stuff about upcoming things under this readme file here. The first of those, most important of those, is before class, uh, well, actually, the second one's the most important. I'll do the second one first, uh, is that on next Monday, we will have a quiz. So. 9 September, and we'll cover all of the material from topic zero. Today, we will finish out that notes packet. And the format of the quiz is described in this practicequiz.pdf file. We'll go ahead and take a look at that for a second. And come right here. There's going to be a bunch of true and false questions, or not a bunch. There will be exactly four true or false questions, and your quiz will be out of four points. You'll have to, for each one of those four questions, identify whether it is a true, a false, or an open problem. An open problem, again, means that uh, we don't currently know whether it is true or false. The only place where we have seen open problems so far is in our uh, notes packets. Let's come right here. In this computational linear algebra notes packet, if we come down to the uh, section on matrix multiplication runtimes, the blast level three, this big paragraph over here describes our currently uh, open uh, problems. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the uh, so I'm not reading this, going through it in detail right here, but this uh, issue here in BLAST3 is our only section on that ha involves open problems at this point. Uh, uh, here we go, back over here. And so you'll have to identify whether something is true or false or whether it is an open problem. So we've seen, we started the, the class that's talking about the lots of big O notation things. So the First few example problems over here related to uh, big O notation. Then there's uh, uh, matrix uh, multiplication runtimes, which we talked about last time. And then the last sort of problems down here, which we'll be getting to today, are we have big complicated sort of uh, formulas and what's the runtime of those expressions. Um, a note on grading here. So again, you will have exactly four problems. Every problem you get correct is worth one point. Uh, part that students always dislike about these uh, sort of quizzes, though, is that if you put an incorrect problem, uh, I will not give you zero points. I will take off a point. So um, two correct, two incorrect is a zero out of four. And uh, if you leave a problem blank, then you will get zero points. 
Uh, for these sorts of multiple choice questions, one of the purposes of these uh, types of questions is to help you develop your own confidence about or uh, the ability to uh, rank your confidence about how sure you are, whether a problem is correct or incorrect. And so that's why there's this extra aspect of uh, penalty for the incorrect answers. I'll pause here for uh, questions in a little bit, but uh, still more things to power through here. If you would like answer keys to the quiz, there is an answer key for this quiz. It is under, it's not printed out, but it is in this file right here uh, with the underscore solutions at the end. I have all the answers. Uh, some of those answers might be, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm not guaranteeing 100% they're all correct, but I might have made a mistake somewhere typing uh, those up, doing copy and paste. So I just did that really quick right before class here. So I hope they're correct, but there might be one or two incorrect ones. So if you think there's an incorrect solution or if you're not sure what the correct solution is, you can always post an issue on GitHub over the weekend, weekend asking why is problem four true and not false or whatever. And uh, I will do my best to, to answer that, uh, resolve your questions before the, uh, the quiz. Last administrative thing about the quiz here is that uh, the quiz will take 10 minutes. You'll have the first 10 minutes of class. It's only four problems. So my hope is that this is not going to be a time crunch thing for anybody. My goal is that it's not a time crunch thing for anybody. But if for whatever reason you would like to have more than 10 minutes on the quiz, then I will be in class here at least 10 minutes early, possibly up to 20 minutes early. And as soon as you enter class, you're allowed to start uh, taking the quiz and working on it. And so that uh, can give you roughly five to six or seven minutes per question to, to work on. Um, me personally, it takes me, I don't know, no time to do the, to get the answers. I just, uh, after you read it, know the answer. Uh, might take you a little bit more time than that, but uh, uh, you should not be like stretched for time on this quiz. My hope is that nobody is pushed for time and it's really testing your concepts and not your ability to do them quickly. Um, last thing about the quiz administratively is that uh, this is a fully open note quiz, so the note up here describes this. Uh, you'll be allowed to use any handwritten or electronic reference material that you would like, including access to websites like Wolfram Alpha or ChatGPT, whatever you want. Uh, the only restriction is that you can't communicate with other students about the, the quiz while you're working on it. I'll do a couple of practice problems here in a second, but before that, any questions about anything administrative related to the quiz? I'll be back. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. So for the concluding websites, I don't care what you do, do whatever you want. You don't have to record anything that you did it or didn't do it. Uh, it's just, you can use your laptops just like you have it in front of you now. Type in whatever you want. Feel free to type in the question exactly as it's written into ChatGPT and circle whatever ChatGPT tells you to do. Um, I've done that for a number of these. It gets most of them wrong. Uh, but you're allowed to use it if you would like to. Good question. Any other questions? Administrative. Yeah, so the quiz will be out of four points total. 100% will be four out of four points. It is possible to get negative four out of four points. Uh, and if that happens, I will enter a negative score in for you for Sakai. Uh, I hope it doesn't happen. Uh, it's also the case, though, keep in mind that see, these quizzes, they're worth four points total. Your next midterm is out of 64 points or 128 points. It's out of a lot of points. So these quizzes are basically nominal things, don't really affect your grade. Um, they just uh, uh, worth some amount of points in order to force you to study, not fall behind in the class. That's really the point of these quizzes, to make sure that you're not falling behind in the class. And uh, the, the, the midterms are really where most of the, the, the evaluation point-wise is going to happen. Also, another side note about evaluation and the, the midterms and final is that the, uh, the midterms and final, if you do really well on any of those, then I love taking a student who, for whatever reason, has a grade lower than they would like, maybe a C, and bumping them up to an A because they did really well in one of these midterms and finals. And so these, like, yeah, the performance on these quizzes is really not something that I think uh, you should be stressed out about. 
The, the purpose of these is just to make sure that you're keeping up with uh, the pace of class and whatever score you get on the quiz is an indication to you whether you fully understand it or not understand it. Did that answer your question? Yeah. So nothing, there's no percentages in this course. Everything is just out of points. And so if we go over to the syllabus down here into the uh, points, quizzes are worth either uh, four points or eight points. Okay. Um, that's another thing. Okay, yeah, it's on your like old GitHub. Because like when I was signing up for this class, someone was like, "Oh, like here's this old GitHub with the last semester," and it did say like, "If you miss a point on the quiz, then you fail out of your class." Uh, yeah, not a thing. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's do just a couple of uh, sample problems here, really quick on the quiz just to get a sense about the way that you should be thinking through uh, these sorts of quiz problems. So again, the uh, packet that I'm looking at right now is this practice quiz, computational linear algebra right here. And uh, uh, I don't, let's see, the, the problem that I want us to look at here, we'll start with number seven right here. And the way I have this opened, I can't write on it, so I'll just explain the reasoning and uh, and what the answer is here. But um, the uh, the important thing about this quiz, one of the things that this quiz is really going to test is your understanding of these asymptotic notations, like big O notation and theta notation and um, uh, omega notation. And so that's what this hint right here is saying is that ensure you pay careful attention to the formal definitions of asymptotic notation in all of your responses. And this is the part where ChatGPT really fails, is that it doesn't pay attention to the formal definitions of these, this asymptotic notation. So here on problem seven, we say that let A and B be n by n matrices. And so I say then the fastest possible algorithm for computing the matrix product AB has runtime O of n to the fourth. And we talked last time about how matrix uh, product is a... Uh, cubic algorithm, and we talked about how there's a lot of uh, unknown things, open problems related to matrix multiplication at this point. Uh, uh, but we know that the runtime is going to be O of n to the cube. That's one of the things that we know, is that the runtime of this product here is O of n cubed. And that's just a fact stated in the other set of notes. And now the question is that if something is O of n to the cubed, is it also O of n to the fourth? And the naive answer here is to say false, because if something's in cube, then it's not into the fourth. But that is incorrect, because uh, these uh, big O notation is just an upper bound. So when I say that the matrix product AB has runtime O of into the fourth, uh, this is true because it uh, is going to be faster than into the fourth. We don't know the best possible algorithm. It's somewhere greater than two, less than 2.2. Um, but uh, we do know that it is less than into the fourth, and so this is going to be a true answer right here. Uh, so the yeah the trick here is you just have to look up in this other set of notes right here the the, the details of matrix uh, runtimes here this underlined in blue right here is where it's describing that it's a cubic thing, and then you have to understand that based on the fact that it is uh, cubic is that going to um, also imply that it is into the fourth? And the answer is yes, based on the definition of big O. Any questions on seven? Yes. Um, so the question I have is like, why it's like O of n to the third and not omega of n to the third? What? Um, so the question about why is it O of n cubed instead of omega n cubed? And there's multiple levels of ways of asking this sort of why question. For the purpose of this class, the reason why we care, or the, the, the thing to that you have to know for grading, is just what's explicitly stated right here. And in the blue right here, it states that the matrix product AB takes time O of M times N times O. Uh, and if all these things are the same, then that, if they're all equal to N, then that's N cubed. Um, so the most straightforward reasoning here is just that that's what the notes say. and uh, so that's why it's big O and not big omega. Um, 
Big omega, uh, a slightly more complicated answer than that, though, is that big omega is a lower bound saying that everything must take at least this amount of time. Big O is an upper bound saying that things can take at most this amount of time. And we do, in fact, have algorithms that are faster than cubic for matrix multiplication. Uh, the most commonly actually used one is Strassen's algorithm, which takes time into the 2.8. But then we also have these uh, sort of... Um, galactic algorithms that I just briefly mentioned the Wikipedia page for last time, where there's runtimes of like into the 2.37, blah, 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 blah. And that mathematicians only recently in the last year reduced this digit out in the six decimal places by a very small factor. Um, so there are algorithms faster than cubic. So that's why we say the runtime is big O and not big omega. Yes. Um, why do we take N? Uh, what do you mean in as the ceiling? As in like the, the upper bound takes n values instead of like what if m and o are bigger than n? So the question is what if m and o are bigger than n here? And the answer, uh, and then how would we think about that? How would we reason about that? The answer is that here I stated that a and b are n by n matrices, so they're square matrices. And so the only like parameter, the only variable that's involved here is the letter n. And so that's why the uh, the runtime down here is written in terms of the letter N. In the, the original notes packets, A and B were arbitrarily shaped matrices of A was M times N, B was N times O. And so this is the more general runtime here of M, N, O for two arbitrary matrices. Um, but then over here, we have this more specific case where the M and the O have been set equal to N. And in general, like the, the true false question here, instead of n by n, it could be like a q by q matrix. And then this would be O of q to the fourth instead of n to the fourth. Um, I just happen to use the letter n right here. Did that answer your question? OK, number eight. I also want to do number eight right here. Uh, eight is similar. We have two matrices, A times B, and it says that the fastest algorithm for computing the matrix product AB has runtime theta of n squared log n. And this is uh, different in two ways. The first way is that we have changed the asymptotic notation up here from O to theta. And the second way is that the content or the function over here, the G function, is a different value. Recall that theta means both O and omega, so both an upper bound and a lower bound. Theta is the strongest thing that you can say about asymptotic notation. And it's the thing that intuitively uh, a lot of data structures classes, in, when they focus on the intuition, they often uh, uh, focus on, or they, the thing they teach is theta notation when they, the thing that they write or use is big O notation. But theta is different than O. O is only upper bound. Theta is upper and lower bound. Theta is O and omega. If we come back over to our notes here, we can see that the best known lower bound of matrix multiplication runtime is this right here, omega of n squared log n. Omega of n squared log n, that is the best known uh, lower bound of matrix multiplication. We know that it must be something at least that. Uh, but our best known upper bound is this right here, that it must be something less than n to the 2.37. And so when I say on problem 8 right here that the runtime has theta n squared log n, uh, we, we've checked the omega. It is, in fact, omega of n squared log n. We know it must be uh, slower than that, but we don't know if it is this fast or not. We currently have an algorithm that is slower than that, but we don't know if there exists an algorithm that has this runtime. And so this is an open problem and not a true problem or a false problem. We don't know if there exists an algorithm with this runtime speed or not. So it is an open problem. In general, for something to be an open problem, it is not enough that the problem statement doesn't give you enough information to determine it. It's that no matter what possible information could be stated in the problem, uh, nobody in the world currently knows whether it could be true or false. Uh, so that's the distinction of an open problem and a false problem. Getting a handle on like this existence of open problems is one of the purposes of this course. Again, the purpose of this course is both to teach you a handful of things about data mining, but also, and probably more importantly, help you 
uh, understand the way people talk and think about data mining, the way that uh, so that you can go on and read your own uh, future research papers as you need to to understand what people are doing in the data mining world. And in order to do that, you'll have to understand this idea of what are open research problems versus things that we already know to be true or to be false. Any questions about problem eight there? Yes. The questions will not be the same. Uh, the questions will be uh, follow this format, but I will change the, the questions. Uh, and in particular, I've already given you all the answers to this questions. So it's, um, it wouldn't make sense for them to be the same. Like, do they memorize what you've given us like, on the sheet before when you were trying to describe like, why this way it is? If we memorize those, do you think that would be equitable being able to understand the problems? Um, so I'm just gonna zoom in on the word memorize here, and there will be certain things in this class that I will force you to memorize, um, but since this is a fully open notes, open everything um, uh, quiz, there is nothing that you have to memorize for this because you can always have, for example, and I would certainly recommend having this page open as you're working on those particular true and false problems. Um, but yes, there's a sufficient number of facts in here to solve all of those problems. Okay. All of those problems are immediate co consequences of these statements here in the notes. Uh, yeah, I, I had originally scheduled the quiz for uh, Wednesday. I think in general, in, in the future, I'm gonna try to have quizzes on Wednesdays so that you'll have uh, the opportunity office hours on Tuesday, the day before, to uh, ask whatever questions uh, you have to get those answered. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with a quiz on Monday, there's no like office hours on Sunday for you to come and ask questions about. Uh, but I do have office hours tomorrow, so I recommend working through as much of this as possible to get yourself ready for the quiz. Um, uh, so that if there are questions, things that you want to clarify, uh, you can do that tomorrow. If for whatever reason you can't do that in time for tomorrow, for tomorrow's office hours, uh, and you still have questions, you're welcome to post those as issues to GitHub and I will do my best to respond to those uh, before uh, the quiz. Any other questions about anything related to the quiz? Office hours, Tuesday, Thursdays, 9 to 11. Okay, other things that I passed out today are uh, this uh, notes one for PageRank right here and this deeper inside PageRank paper. The, uh, we probably won't get to either of these two uh, packets today. Uh, we definitely will be covering them next Monday, uh, but there is also some things that I would like you to do as part of this PageRank one packet before class on Monday. Again, part of the purpose of this class is to teach you how to like read mathematics, read data mining papers on your own. And so the first thing that I would like you to do is start reading uh, the, these notes packets and the, uh, the, the page rank paper on your own. If we come back over here to the class webpage, uh, this note right here says, before Monday, uh, please complete sections one and two of this notes one.pdf file. These two sections are uh, right here, this background information, just a little bit of reading. Uh, there's a, a recommended but not required YouTube video here to watch. Uh, it's by Matt Cutts. He's a very famous uh, Googler. Uh, he's in charge, was in charge of Google's entire web search uh, team uh, and uh, currently has switched over to the United States Digital Service in charge of basically every web page in the US government. Uh, and here he's explaining the high level intuition behind PageRank and why it's useful for, uh, for web search. So it's a useful but not required background uh, uh, viewing. This reference to right here is, uh, so this link right here takes you to the, uh, this deeper inside PageRank. And for our class over the next uh, week or two, we'll be covering this paper and you'll be responsible for this set of sections uh, right here. On the printout, I accidentally printed this before I added these two lines right here. Uh, but besides these two sections, these are, these are the sections that you're required to know absolutely everything in. 
I also want you to read sections four and 6.3, um, but you will not be responsible at all for sections 5.2 or section seven plus. So I want you to make a, a first pass at reading as much of this as you can, understanding as much as, of it as you can, but especially these earlier sections, one, two, and three, that, that go more into the uh, background intuition about things. So that's the first thing to do, reading. The second thing to do under this definitions, the section two here, there's a handful of uh, definitions that are, are defined in the reading. And one of the things that you have to do while you are reading a paper is keep track of many different definitions about things in your head. And so this first problem right here is just to write down uh, word for word exactly what all the definitions are of all of these different terms. This is something that I will be having you memorize and you'll have a quiz, a closed note quiz on this exact problem right here, where you just have to have all these definitions memorized and be able to reproduce them. That quiz is not next week, uh, it'll be the week afterwards, uh, but you should start that process, getting these definitions written down and starting that memorization. Next week in class, we'll be going over, I'll have assumed that you've already completed these two sections and we'll be going over some of the math stuff down below. But any questions about what to do before next Monday in class? Yes. Uh, I mean, it's just word for word what's in the in the text. There's no like um, you have to come up with it yourself. So um, yeah, you already know the answer. You just have to find it in the text and copy it down. Yeah, it's literally just manually copy and paste, write it out. Any other questions? So yes. The first quiz is only on the very first notes packet, the topic zero. Um, so not at all on these definitions, not at all on uh, these new handouts. <clears throat> yeah, the first quiz only on this handout right here, the computational linear algebra. Expect a quiz every week. There'll be some weeks that we don't have them. Good questions. Any other questions so far? Okay. Just ruined everybody's weekend with lots of work to do. I apologize, but it'll be fun eventually. Uh, Okay, today, rest of class, technical stuff, we will be uh, completing this notes packet, going over the last of the things that you need to know for your uh, quiz. And maybe actually one last motivation thing before we actually get into this notes packet. Here in the Deeper Inside page rank, the reason why we're doing this original notes packet is to prepare us for this paper right here and the subsequent textbook that we'll be using. And I'm just gonna do a real quick search right here for equation 5.1. This is, uh, you don't have to get to this point in the, the reading, but you can see there's this big complicated linear algebra equation right here. And inside of data mining tests, they will often have these big complicated looking equations right here. And they will not tell you what the runtime of this equation is. They will just tell you this equation is slow or this equation is fast, or we don't wanna do this equation, we wanna do this other equation because one's slower or faster. And the purpose of this first set of notes, what we've been building up to is being able to understand, being able to look at equation like this and be able to uh, tell what the runtime of something like this is. Uh, so that's why we're doing that. That's why what we're building up to in our last part of this first note packet. And that will prepare you for doing this in the uh, subsequent section on page rank. Again, we have the example I used at the beginning here, this equation right here. Uh, less scary looking than the equation that we'll uh, have to do in PageRank. Okay, last times we started off again with all the big O notation stuff. And then we, uh, BLAST again stands for the Basic Linear Algebra Subsystem. This is a generic interface for libraries, uh, PyTorch included. Uh, PyTorch is what you'll be using for your uh, homework assignment related to PageRank. And uh, uh, there's a generic interface to these, these functions. You don't have to know the interface in detail, but you will hear people talking about BLAST and BLAST levels, and so I've divided the notes up according to those BLAST levels. Uh, we've also talked about the difference between dense and sparse matrices. That'll come up a lot in the PageRank paper about when you want to 
uh, certain matrices or vectors to be dense and when you want them to be sparse. Uh, so that'll be something important to be paying attention to and it will affect the run times a great deal whether you use the correct uh, type of matrix. Um, again, there's a handful of these problems that I'm not covering in class explicitly. Uh, these sorts of problems, they might come up on the quizzes, but more importantly, they'll come up on your midterm exams. Uh, we'll talk about the format of those midterm exams and, and final exams later on, but roughly I'm just going to have these note packets in front of me and I'll open it up to a page and say like problem six right here, uh, do it on the whiteboard and you'll have to do it on the whiteboard. And so having done it previously in the set of notes will help you tremendously being able to uh, do it on the spot when I ask you to do it. So again, these note packets, not something that you're required to do. I'm not, you don't have to turn them in. I'm not going to grade them, but completing these problems, uh, even the ones that we don't explicitly go over in class will help you on the quizzes and the midterm final exams. Um, okay, we did a lot of problems here in the BLAST level one and uh, three that are basically just copying the run times from the, the big text blob up above down into the particular situation where I have it described below. Uh, so here, the last one we did, I think, was problem four right here, where we had to say that, okay, A and B are M by N matrices, and if they're dense, they're O of M and O is the runtime, and if they're sparse, uh, it's the N and Z, A times O, the number of non-zero elements in the first matrix times the outer dimension of the second matrix here times O. And these are things, these are facts that I just copied down from the, uh, from the, the set of notes up above. Any questions about where we're at, what we've done so far, where we're going? Um, yes. Um, are you looking at a particular problem? problem six. Question is about problem six right here. It says prove or provide a counter example. And so for both sparse and dense matrices, the storage requirements are O of M times uh, N. And so a counter example would be uh, uh, providing a, an example of a, uh, a matrix that the storage requirement is not O of M times N. Um, so this particular uh, problem right here, problem six, is uh, true. Uh, so a counterexample is not something that uh, uh, can happen. Um, if you do have, again, questions on any problems in particular, happy to uh, go over those in detail with you in uh, office hours. Um, but we'll start here where we left off, this problem five right here. And this is uh, uh, going to be a very easy problem still, problem 5A times B transpose. Uh, it's going to have the exact same runtime as A times B, that first we compute the transpose. First, compute the transpose. And one of the facts in uh, the, the paragraphs up above is that the transpose always takes constant time, whether you are working with sparse matrices or dense matrices, the transpose always takes constant time. The reason for that is because uh, computing a transpose, uh, the, the uh, code that does that is not going to actually uh, compute the transpose. It's not gonna re rearrange anything in memory. Instead, though, it'll just have a little flag that says this matrix has been transposed. And then when it actually does the, the multiplication here, it will read things, read the elements in the transposed order. And so the transpose itself takes no time. Then the, the matrix multiplication here is going to be the same. It's just a, 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 a times B a matrix multiplication. So it's the same as above. This first compute, the transpose takes time, theta of one. And then uh, the multiplication itself is the same as above. So in general, when you have a transpose in your computations, it's not going to affect the run times of anything. <clears throat> a little bit more interesting here, this A times X. So again, we always have to specify the, the dimensions of things. So A we'll say is N by M 
And then the X, in order for this to uh, make sense, for the dimensions to line up, X has to have uh, dimension M. And when I uh, uh, think of X here as a matrix, that's equivalent to being like M by one. And so when I compare these values to the values up above in this uh, paragraph right here, this underlined blue part, the A has shape M by N, that's already the letters match up. Here the B has shape N by O. Um, so here this would be the, the O value right here of our matrix. And so the, the runtime of a X in the dense case is O of the N and M from the A, N and M from the A. The O here from the X is just a one, so I don't need to carry that over. I just say O of N times N. In the sparse case, we have that it is the number of non-zeros in A times the outer dimension, uh, the O dimension of the rightmost uh, matrix over here. That dimension is only equal to one. So in the sparse case, that'll be O or theta more specifically of just N and Z of, of A like that. Again, the only thing that I did here for computing these runtimes is treat X here as a matrix instead of as a vector, and then the O here was equal to one, because uh, that is what the dimension of our of our matrix is, and substitute that one here anytime the O appeared in the equations. So then basically the same thing, but doing it in the opposite order, so I am uh, not going to do that. Problem 12 here is one that I uh, will let you work on on your own. Same for 13 here. And we're going to jump down here to 3.7, uh, this matrix chain ordering problem. Everything we've done previously has all been just like rote copying from the, uh, the definitions, uh, paragraphs, those important facts. Here in 3.7 and below, we're going to start getting into more interesting things about runtimes. And uh, so this will be where the notes packet starts getting more interesting and um, uh, the sort of decisions that you'll have to make while you're actually programming are gonna be focused around the, uh, the problems we see here in 3.7. So the idea here in this first problem is that we have three matrices, A, B, and C, and their shapes are N by N, N by O, and O by P. So their shapes are arranged so that we can compute the matrix product A times B times C. And what this paragraph up here is saying is that matrix multiplication is not commutative, so you can't change the order of these multiplications, but it is associative. So you can put parentheses in different locations and you'll get the same results. Mathematically, uh, this formula right here, first doing A times B, then times C, will get you the same result as first doing B times C and then multiplying by A. But computationally, these will have two different runtimes. And so these problems are asking us to figure out what are those runtimes going to be and which one should we uh, prefer to do in which situation. In order to compute the runtime here of this first uh, problem, uh, we have a matrix product right here of A times B. So we've said that the Previously from above, A times B, I'll do these all in the dense case. And the A times uh, B, the runtime here will be O of M times N times O, O of M, N, O like this. And the shape of A times B right here uh, so the two colons right here is what I use as notation-wise for the shape of a matrix or the type of the variable on the left-hand side. And this will have uh, shape M by O. So the product A times B over here, we're getting rid of this N, this inner dimension, and we have shape M times O right here. <clears throat> so that's the first multiplication that we have to do. Uh, but we're not done because there's a second multiplication that we have to do of taking this matrix right here, AB, and uh, actually multiplying it times C. 
So here I'm saying that I'm, I've already computed A, B, and now we're multiplying it by C. Maybe a different way of writing that out, which is easier, is if I first assign this to a new variable Z, and then say Z times C, what is that going to be equal to? It's just a single matrix multiplication. We know what the runtime of this is. The runtime here will be O of the two uh, dimensions of Z, M times O, M times O, plus the outer dimension of C, the outer dimension of the rightmost matrix here, which is P, so M O P. And the final shape of this is going to be the leftmost shape of Z, which is M, times the rightmost uh, dimension of C, which is P, so M times P. I have to do two matrix multiplications here, one after the other. So the overall runtime is going to be the sum of this and this. You're going to first did this step and then did this step down here. So O of M and O plus M O P is the final runtime here for these two, uh, or for this expression here, parenthesized the way it is. Are there any questions about why this is the runtime for this expression right here? Yes. So the question is going over the dimensions uh, that I was referencing here. And the answer is in this first product here, this A times B, I have the dimensions listed up here. And the, the, uh, the dimensions of the resulting matrix Z, which I'm calling Z, uh, which is equal to A times B, is always going to be the outer of the dimensions of the two matrices. The inner dimensions here, these ins, these always have to match each other when you're doing a matrix multiplication. And these dimensions uh, go away, so you only have the outer dimensions left, so the M and the O. And so that's why right here, I said that the, uh, the dimension of Z is going to be M times O. Then uh, down here, doing the Z times C, um, so Z times C, the C here is O times P. The O dimension right here, let me sw switch colors. The O dimension right here has to match this O dimension right here because those two are the inner dimensions of the matrix multiplication. And the M and the P are going to be the final dimensions of my final product. because those are the ones on the outside of the leftmost dimension of Z and the rightmost dimension of C are the M and the P here. When I do the uh, calculations of the runtime, uh, you have one of each of the dimensions inside of it. So M and O, even though the N doesn't appear right here, the N still appears in the runtime. And we still have O down here in our runtime for this product, because even though the O doesn't appear in the dimension, it still appears in the runtime. Uh, yes? Question is for sparse matrices, and I'm going to uh, hold off on that. That uh, uh, the uh, the reason I'm holding off for it is because the the ordering again of uh, matrix multiplication for sparse matrices. The thing on the left always has to be uh, sparse, and um, uh, so it'll be a little bit more complicated. So just starting with just dense right now. Sorry, did, I, did that answer your question too? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll go through these same steps here for this other parenthesization, and we'll see that we get a different overall runtime, and uh, uh, that will inform our decision on which, uh, uh, which of these two parenthesizations is going to be the most performant for our particular application. So what is the runtime of computing uh, first B times C and then A? Switch back to red here. So if we do B times C first, the runtime is going to be all those dimensions put together. So we are in B and C, we have N, O, and P as our uh, dimensions. So O of NOP, N, O, P. The final shape of, uh, again, I'll just use the letter Z here for equal to BC. The shape of BC will be N times P because those are the outer dimensions of the B and the C matrix. The O dimension, which is the inner dimension that has to match, goes away. And then I do A times uh, C right here. And the runtime of that, 
the runtime of a times c is the product of all of the dimensions put together. A has m times n, and then we add a p right here, so that's O of m in p. And the shape of this is going to be the same m times p, m times uh, p. The final shape of our uh, matrix is not going to be affected by the parenthesization because, again, it's associative. It doesn't matter how you parenthesize it. Mathematically, you'll get the same results. Just computationally, you'll have different runtimes. And so now when we add both of these two uh, things together, we get O of NOP plus MNP as my two uh, runtimes right here. And you'll notice that these formulas right here are different than these formulas up here. And so one of these is likely to be much smaller for your particular problem than the other. Uh, you, uh, just thinking about only dense at this point. Yes. Question is, are we just not thinking about sparse? And the answer, I, I, probably, I, might, I must not have explicitly wrote the word dense here. Uh, but yes, this, we just want to think about dense at this point. Kate. Uh, good question. The question is here, I uh, wrote A times C. This should be A times Z. Everything I said was uh, A times uh, Z, uh, except I wrote the letter C right here. So good catch. Thank you. Uh, so the last part of this problem, under what conditions would you choose the former parenthesization over the latter? There's a lot of different things that you can uh, say here, but uh, one of the things that you can say here is, okay, uh, M up here appears in both of these terms. Maybe I'll uh, factor this out to be like M O times N plus P, this O of that. Um, uh, down here it is, so we have NOP, uh, N and P appear in both terms, N and P times uh, uh, O plus M, thank you, O plus M. And it's not like necessarily easy to find like a quick summary of what's going on here, um, uh, but just whenever one of these terms is obviously smaller than, uh, if, so you'd prefer the one up top if this is much less than the one on bottom. So say the MO if MO N plus P is less than NP times O plus M. Uh, a common question that students have is like on an exam, what level of detail do you need to be able to go into? Uh, and one of the reasons why I like these oral exams over the written exams is because uh, it allows, it kind of absolves that question that, um, that if you were, uh, uh, because yeah, there's no, like you don't have to worry about, did I provide enough level of detail in, uh, in my answer down here, if I think you there's something that you're you're missing, then I can just ask more more questions about that. And if there's uh, if I feel like you have the basic ideas down, then then we're done and we can move on to the to the next problem without you having to uh, uh, waste a lot of time on on writing a lot of uh, maybe nonsense things. So the the details here of number three, there's not like a one correct answer. This is the thing that you should put down, but just having the basic idea that whichever one of these two numbers is smaller is the thing that you want to do. Questions about that? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> more interesting things. Let's see. I want to skip here problem 15 as well and come down here to uh, problem 16 and this note 7 right here. Uh, so the note 7 here has a handful of facts about the matrix chain ordering problem. Uh, the, the basic idea of this problem is that uh, computers can optimally compute this uh, this 
ordering for us, but it is uh, relatively expensive for them to do. And it turns out that we actually, there's another problem where we don't know what the optimal uh, runtime is. So the highlights here are that the best known algorithm for matrix chain ordering, so deciding what order to do the parentheses, the best known algorithm takes time theta of n log n. Um, but all that we know about the best possible algorithm is that it has runtime of omega of n. So the best possible algorithm could be linear in the number of matrices, uh, but it might not be. We don't know. Problem 16 down here. So let's see some really obvious examples of when the ordering of our parenthesization uh, goes way off the rails and when it's really good. That uh, These are all vectors down here. And with vectors, we'll get um, very clear differences between the, the ordering of parenthesization. Again, all these vectors um, should be thought of as dense. In general, if, if, there's never a if there's not a remark about whether something is dense or sparse, it's all, you should always assume dense. So assume dense unless otherwise specified. And this is a very common thing that uh, in like computational literature in general with matrices, computational linear algebra, whether data mining or a different field, things are always assumed dense unless otherwise specified. So I'm going to think about two different parenthesizations here. The first one will be if we do x transpose x like this, and then x transpose x like this, like that parenthesization. And the other parenthesization will be if I do x, x transpose first, followed by an x over here, followed by an x transpose over here. Both of these are doing three blast level three operations, three matrix multiplications, uh, but we'll see that they have very different runtime properties. On the left-hand side here, this first X, X transpose, if X has shape, X has shape, um, we'll do N by one here, then this is X transpose X, X transpose will have shape one by N, Again, x has shape n by 1. And so this runtime, I'll abbreviate it RT for runtime, will be equal to O of <clears throat> just uh, uh, n. Uh, we have 1 times n. These are the same in both dimensions, times 1. So the runtime of this operation is just n. This x transpose x is also just computing an inner product. And we saw before in the blast level 1 operations that the inner product takes linear time. This is the same uh, operation over here, x transpose x. And so this uh, will also have runtime of O of n like this. The final shape of both of these x transpose x's, again, it is a, an inner product. Uh, the outer dimensions here are both equal to 1. So the shape here for both of these will be 1 by 1. And so when I multiply a 1 by 1 times a 1 by 1 matrix, the, uh, the final multiplication, again, I'll call this here a, uh, a, this here B. And so A times B is uh, just two scalars multiplied together. And so the runtime of that is going to be equal to O of 1. We have three matrix multiplications here, a linear, a linear, and a constant. Adding all those together, we get the overall runtime is O of, is o of N. Overall runtime O of n. I'm sort of skipping a lot of steps here because this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> in some sense, the steps are obvious. Again, like after you've worked through a couple of these problems, you'll be able to just look at this and say exactly what the runtime is here without writing down any of these details. Um, but writing down as much as you need to or not need to is. Uh, is what you should do for the quizzes if there's a problem like this. Any questions, though, about why the runtime of this particular parenthesization is linear O of n? Yes? Why is the O1 of O of n the same thing as A overall? Um, a, uh, so I'm here, the shape of A being 1 by 1, the shape of B being 1 by 1. Uh, the shape is one by one because here the we have one by n for x transpose x is n by one. The inner 
dimensions go away. So we just get dimension one by one. So A here is a one by one matrix or just a scalar, a single number. B here is the same exact thing. It's a one by one matrix or just a uh, scalar number. And uh, so it's just the two scalar mul numbers multiply each other, which is constant time, or using the same formula of all the different indexes multiplied together. They're all one multiplied together, so we just get a one. So it's only focusing on the multiplication of these two numbers, this constant runtime, and not on the, uh, the steps that happened before as well. So when we include the steps that happened before as well, the, there were two linear runtimes plus uh, a constant runtime. So if we could write out something like O of 2n plus 1, uh, but that's the exact same thing as O of n. Yes? Um, can x be 1 by n and not n by Question is, could x be uh, 1 by n instead of n by 1? Uh, convention is that it, it's always an in, in, in by 1 thing, and that the x transpose x is always the inner product. Um, so yeah, the question is, what happens if it's flipped? Would we get a different answer? And that's roughly what's going to happen here on this x other side over here. This xx transpose is also known as the outer product instead of the inner product. And so here when we have uh, x, again, being an n by 1, maybe I'll change my color here so that it's easier to read. Um, x being an n by 1, and now x transpose, x transpose being a 1 by n. It's called the outer product because we get a matrix as the result instead of a scalar. And when we, so the, the final shape here, the final shape here is going to be n by n, n by n. And the runtime of computing this, the runtime of computing this is going to be O of n squared. n times 1 times n here gives us n squared. And so if you're ever computing the outer product of two vectors, you get this n squared runtime. All the other uh, products here are going to be um, uh, similarly n squared. Here we have, uh, so this was this first, call this, all this stuff in orange here that's related to uh, computing, we'll call this value right here, A, this inner transpose, this inner parentheses as A. Then this next here, uh, a times x, a times x. If a has this uh, n by n shape, x has the n by 1 shape, then the runtime of that or the final shape of that will be, shape of that will be uh, n by 1. The runtime of that computation will be O of n squared. And um, uh, because we have a n by n by 1, so that's n squared, simplifying that. And so this whole thing right here, we'll call that equal to uh, B. That's equal to B. And then the final multiplication here, C, everything together, C being equal to uh, X transpose times B. The shape of X transpose, again, being equal to 1 by N. The shape of B being equal to N by 1. So the final shape here being 1 by 1, the same final shape as before. Uh, the runtime of this, though, being equal to O of N. And so we get an N squared plus N squared plus N. Whoops. Sorry. Pit page down, I think. Final runtime of uh, all these computations together, the overall uh, runtime being N squared plus N squared plus N which is just O of n squared. So doing this parenthesization where you have, where you're computing an outer product of vectors instead of an inner product of vectors makes the computation significantly slower uh, doing n squared instead of linear time, quadratic instead of linear time. Uh, so as you're computing things uh, in practice, it's very easy to accidentally do something like this instead of doing something like this. And you need to be aware that the left-hand parenthesization is the faster, more effective thing to do. Again, there's uh, I, I work through these problems in sort of a medium level of detail and maybe not showing absolutely every step, um, but also showing some steps. Uh, this is the sort of thing that some people uh, with experience will be able to just look at it and say, oh, this parenthesization is obviously linear, linear, this one's obviously quadratic. Uh, but you can do as much 
show as much work as you need to in order to uh, get your get your answer. There's no right or wrong amount of work to show. Any questions about problem 16 here? Yes. Question is, can you write the answer as uh, O of two n squared? Uh, is it okay to say O of two n squared instead of O of n squared? The answer is technically yes. Both of these, anything that is O of n squared is also O of 2n squared. Anything that is O of 2n squared is also O of n squared. Um, so technically the answer is yes. But if you were to ever say to anybody O of 2n squared, they will look at you like you're weird because, and be very confused because uh, this is just a more complicated thing to write and say than this. So people always report things in simplified terms. If on a final exam, midterm exam in my office, you were to say something like O of 2n squared instead of O of n squared, my first suspicion would be that you don't fully understand asymptotic notation. And so then I would start asking detailed, complicated questions about asymptotic notation uh, to try to get you to figure out that these things should be simplified to each other. Uh, so the answer is that it's technically correct to say this, um, but nobody does, and so you shouldn't. Good question. I realize a lot of the things that we've, there's a very fine level or a fine difference here between like, or there's a lot of technically correct things going on and a lot of like getting the feel sense of the way people talk about things in the real world going on here. Um, and I think really that's again, the, the purpose of this course. It's frustrating thing about this course, hard thing about this course is finding that fine line between those two things. Um, but finding that line will pay off lots of dividends for you. For example, when you are giving technical interviews to uh, on the interviewee side, um, trying to uh, work at companies, being able to say things in a way that other people will be confident that you know what you're talking about is a very good thing. Um, all great questions so far. I'm going to, um, we'll come down here next to this section four right here. And um, it's called Beyond Blast. There are certain matrix operations that we'll need for this class that are not any of these Blast basics matrix uh, multiplication operations. And the most important of those is the matrix inverse here. The matrix inverse uh, is quadratic in time. Anytime you see an inverse, you think quadratic. Uh, the determinant is something that's, sorry, not quadratic, cubic, in cubed is cubic. The matrix inverse is cubic, not quadratic. Uh, the matrix determinant is also cubic and not quadratic, uh, but at least for data mining applications, the determinant never comes up. The inverse comes up a lot, the determinant never comes up. Um, I've never in my whole life seen an algorithm that involves the determinant at all. The last thing here that is important to know is that the runtime of computing uh, the top k eigenvectors and eigenvalues is O of k n squared, where k, so k here's the number of eigenvectors you're trying to compute, and n squared is going to be the shape of our matrix. All of these operations, uh, inverse determinants, uh, or especially the inverse and the eigenvectors here uh, for these uh, square matrices. Uh, one thing that we will see as we're doing PageRank, uh, the next sections is that PageRank is just computing the top eigenvector of a particular matrix. And so we will explore in detail this K n squared uh, formula from that in the next couple of sections. But at this point, it's just the, these are the facts that you need to know about the runtimes of these algorithms. Yes. Question is, is, are these optimal? And the answer is no. I'm uh, throughout these notes, very careful about the O theta omega notation. And uh, this is not a theta right here. So this means that these are just upper bounds. Uh, these are the way that people think about these algorithms. We think about the inverse as being uh, cubic. We think about the determinant as being cubic. Uh, it turns out though, that the computation of the matrix inverse, for example, can be reduced to very cleverly doing a bunch of multiplications. And so the uh, the runtimes, the optimal runtimes of the inverse 
is going to be whatever the optimal runtime of the um, uh, matrix multiplication is. Um, that's not a fact that you need to know for this course. The important thing, uh, the only thing that will ever come up is the fact that these are upper bounded by, by cubic runtime. The, yes, you can, by solving the multiplication problem, you can solve the inverse problem. Uh, okay, the last set of these problems down here, we have time probably to do one or two of them. Uh, the last set of these problems down here is giving more complicated formulas and finding the run times of these complicated formulas. And again, this is the, really the purpose of this set of notes and something that you'll have to be doing all the time in this class is we will see a set, uh, you'll have a formula that some data mining uh, algorithm relies on some particular formula, and you'll have to be able to compute the runtime of that algorithm based on your understanding of these formulas. So here, uh, problem one, we start with an uh, inverse and then do a matrix, matrix multiplication. So the A uh, inverse computation, the I'll say the shape of the results is still going to be an N by N uh, uh, matrix. Here, because uh, we're taking the inverse, yeah, maybe I'll, let me back up just one step. So A in the notes up here, I'm saying that A has shape M by N. Um, because we are taking an inverse here, so A has shape M by N. Because we're doing the inverse, though, The inverse is only defined on square matrices, so M must, uh, must be equal to N in order to be able to do the inverse here. Uh, so whether your, uh, your runtime is reported in terms of M or in terms of N doesn't really matter because uh, they're going to be equal to each other. So the A inverse, the, the final shape of that will be N by N, and the runtime of computing that will be O of and cubed. Again, being careful here that this is a big O because it's just an upper bound here on what the runtime is. And then if I say that is equal to uh, B, then our next computation uh, is going to be B times X. Draw lines here, separate out these computations. The B times X computation, so X has shape, uh, uh, so B has shape N by N x having shape in in by one so the final shape of this computation here will be in by one and the runtime here will be o of n times the inner dimension here which is also in so n squared times one o of n squared we have two runtimes here uh, two different discrete steps of what we're doing, this n cubed, n squared, overall runtime. Some of those two things, overall runtime is n cubed plus n squared, which is equal to O of n cubed, dropping those small terms. So this would be the, the final answer and the thing that we should be thinking about when we think about the runtime of an expression like A inverse times X, is that it just has a quadratic runtime. Any questions on this problem one right here? Shape of B is what? Yeah. Question is, should the shape of B here be N times M? And the answer is that it, in some sense, it doesn't really matter because M and N must be equal to each other because we're doing an inverse and the inverse is only defined for square matrices. So whether uh, anywhere where I have an N over here, I could replace it with an M and everywhere where I have an M, I could replace it with an N. Um, but uh, so this this m by n here that's really equal to an n by n uh, matrix right here. So it's legitimately confusing that um, yeah the up here in my definition the r here is m by m, um, and you have to somehow infer that these two things need to be the the same value. Uh, that's a common thing that happens in the uh, uh, in the literature that people will at, at one point in the paper say that uh, here's all the different shapes of things and then later on they'll do something that implies that it must be uh, square somehow and so these two values have to be equal to each other and that's something that you just have to uh, 
uh, be able to infer uh, that that happened, even though it's not specifically stated anywhere. Uh, so whether we tracked everything as ins or as ims doesn't matter, uh, but the final expression simplifying everything, it should just have one of those two letters inside of it, not a combination. Good question. Any other questions on this first problem? OK, I will really quickly here do the, the next one of these problems. Uh, here we have uh, A, so type M by N, A transpose, N by M. And so if I call this A, A transpose, we'll call that equal to B, B equals A, A transpose. That's going to have shape M by M. And the runtime for computing that will be equal to O of <clears throat> M times N times M. So m squared n for this first b multiplication. Then I do a uh, compute b inverse. I'll say c equals b inverse. That doesn't change my shape at all, but the runtime of that is going to be equal to m cubed. It must be m. Very careful about the m's and the n's on this problem because they are distinct. The inverse here of b, b has shape m by m. So the runtime of b inverse is going to be o of m cubed. And now I am left with the problem of, so this whole part I will call C. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's what I called it, C over here. That corresponds to this right here. I have uh, C times A times X, C times A times X. And I'll have to think, previously I had no choices that I had to make about parenthesization. Now I do have a choice to make about parenthesization. Do I want to compute it like this? Or do I want to compute it as C times A times X? Uh, the most general thing to do to be correct is to compute uh, the runtimes for anytime you have an option like this, compute the runtimes of both options and see which one is smaller. In this case, uh, I know the one on the right hand side is going to be smaller. So for time, I'll just do the one on the right hand side. And I will call this term A times X equal to uh, uh, D. Uh, A is going to have, again, shape M by N. X having shape N by one. So D will have shape M by one. The runtime for computing D will be O of M times N. And now the final uh, computation that I have to do is C times D. I uh, will go into black. C times D. Up above I had C has shape C has shape M by M. Right over here, I have D has shape M by one. The final shape of this output shape is going to be M by one. And the runtime is going to be O of M squared. So the this M times this M times this one right here is M squared. And now adding all of these two, all four of these steps together, the overall, sorry, I'm going very fast here because we're almost out of time. After I write all this down, I'll stop so you can, if there's things you need to copy, this will also be on YouTube. Uh, but I just want to make sure we don't run over time. Adding this all together, m squared n plus m cubed plus uh, the m n right here, m n right here, plus the m squared right here, plus m squared. Putting all that inside of big O notation, this m squared will cancel out with this m cubed. This m n will cancel out with this m squared n. So that's going to be equal to O of m squared n plus m cubed as the final runtime there. A lot of things there, a lot of steps, easy to get tripped up somewhere along here. Um, but if uh, anybody has questions about this, I'll stick around after class. I'm going to have office hours tomorrow from 9 to 11. Uh, AM. This video will be posted on YouTube. And if you do have questions outside of office hours, you can post them onto GitHub, and I will do my uh, best to answer them via text. That's the end of our class for today. And uh, good luck preparing for the quiz.